नमस्ते वेलकम चार्ल्स नमस्ते वेलकम टू आई हिम सर रोशनी थैंक यू वेरी गुड थैंक यू सो व्हाट इज योर अर्लीएस्ट रिकॉलेक्शन और मेमोरी फ्रॉम चाइल्डहुड ऑफ इदर द कांसेप्ट और द एक्सपीरियंस ऑफ आई हिम सर वेल आई थिंक आई मस्ट हैव बीन अ अ स्टूडेंट um it was around the time that uh Martin Luther King was very active and uh, I was interested in him I knew that he had um a nonviolent approach and I saw somewhere that uh at one time he had learned about Gandhi and his response was to go out and buy several of Gandhi's books and to read them and so that's what i did i uh i went and learned about gandhi i i read his autobiography and i try to reread that autobiography every four or five years how old would have you uh, would you have been at that time i would have been about 18 or 19 years old uh and then um i started studying psychology and i was a little bit politically active in 1967 68 and then when uh dr king was assassinated and shortly thereafter uh robert kennedy was assassinated it shook me up uh it it really um uh it it made me decide to take a year off from the university and at that time i was ha- i had done two years at mcmaster university in canada where that was my hometown and uh i took a year off and i traveled to montreal and i just worked for a year i i was a technician at mcgill university which is another you know great school in canada and then i came back and i pursued my psychology career and um I I kept a liking and a kind of an identification with nonviolence in the back of my mind but it was not what I did every day. Uh and um uh, uh I spent some time in the 1990s as the chair of my department at the University of Rhode Island. Uh I I had become chair and I was talking with a friend of mine whose name is Abu Bakr and um uh, he was the university's uh, lead trainer and um uh, kind of an in-house c- consultant and uh we decided that the university needed a center for conflict resolution to help people like me who was a new chair to deal with people problems that we had never received any formal training in and uh abu discovered in the course of our conversations that uh uh a man named bernard lafayette was coming to providence rhode island where we both lived um to do a training for the providence police department and we asked the city to allow us to join that training so in the summer of 97 abu and i went through a long training of trainers it began in april and it didn't end until sometime in august and we decided in the course of that that our new center would have the word nonviolence in the title and so we hung out a shingle and we said the university now has a center for nonviolence and peace studies and um uh a year or so later we had the chance to hire bernard lafayette to be the director of the center and he came to the university for about 9 years and he was a very charismatic director um and uh that center is still going strong it's uh uh after uh bernard left uh, my colleague uh, paul bueno de mesquita uh became the director and he had 
great interest in uh, Tibetan Buddhism. And uh, he started taking uh, students to Nepal and they've made a number of trips to Nepal. Uh, and the university center hosts uh, an annual training of trainers and they have students who come from Nigeria and uh, uh, other parts of Africa and from uh, South America and all over the United States. It's very successful. Um, in the meantime, I relocated to Maryland uh, and uh, for quite a few years, I commuted back and forth between Maryland and Rhode Island. Um, but in Maryland was a man named Ira Zepp. And uh, uh, he and I started working together in around the year 2000. And uh, we wrote a book, which you know, and uh, I, I'm very happy that you, you know that book. Uh, and uh, I began using that book in teaching. It's, it's called Nonviolence, Origins and Outcomes. And it's a book that I wrote, um, my parts of it anyway. Uh, I wrote it for myself as a new trainer, as a person who was trying to train others and, and teach them about nonviolence. And I wanted a, uh, a book that a new trainer could read and get a greater depth of understanding of the, the breadth of nonviolence and also the intellectual depth of nonviolence. Um, uh, Ira, who's a retired Methodist minister, very progressive uh, minister, he had um, gone to Selma in 1965 because Dr. King called for clergy to come to Selma to help with the voting rights movement. And Ira was one of those uh, clergy. Um, he had a deep appreciation for the American civil rights movement, but also uh, an understanding of things like liberation theology. And uh, um, I, I thought that his thinking coming from a religious perspective complemented my thinking as a psychologist. And so the book contains both perspectives. Uh, we tried to write it so that it is um, from a religious point of view, it's an ecumenical book. It's not uh, sectarian. Um, it's not, it, it contains some elements of Christianity, uh, especially when it talks about agape as one of the roots of nonviolence as we understand it. But it also uh, contains some of the uh, tradition from the Indian subcontinent when it talks about ahimsa. And those are the two roots of nonviolence that we put forward for discussion. In That's right. That book. Um, as to outcomes, uh, which is the other word in the title, nonviolence, origins and outcomes. Uh, I'm interested in the impact that nonviolence education has on a person. And I'm interested in how people learn nonviolence. And I found that that's just an endlessly fascinating um, topic. It keeps me teaching because with every new workshop or class, I get a new group of individuals and they all have different personalities and they all respond to ideas about nonviolence in their own way. And I keep learning things from that. And um, uh, I frankly enjoy that very much. It's, there's no big sacrifice involved when I teach nonviolence. I just enjoy it too much. You have mentioned in your book 
that it always uh, that you in a sense began by noticing how little students in america know about non violence for example they know about martin luther king junior but they don't know about how central non violence was to his life and work and yes. uh, i think that's one of the reasons why you have uh, pursued this path am i correct that's yes that's that's quite true uh students know about dr king only in a very superficial way and um i i very often say that you know they recognize his name uh they know that there's a holiday for him and they know that he had a dream that's about it <laughs> um but uh the idea that his work involved a really serious commitment to nonviolence and that nonviolence is not something you can adopt in an instant something that has to be learned um uh, that is not widely known and uh it needs to be taught and uh and we and a person can have a lot of fun learning about nonviolence because it's like um it's like the discovery of a whole lot of new things that you immediately recognize are very important to you they're very close to the heart <laughs> and um uh but it it in the next instant it makes you wonder why haven't i ever heard these things before why why didn't my teachers tell me this stuff when i was in school years ago yeah so, you know yeah. this reminds me of something that you say in your book about how nonviolence is probably as scary as violence because you say that nonviolence makes people feel more or people suspect that they will end up feeling more vulnerable vulnerable can you elaborate on that please yes that that's a very unfortunate misconception because uh first of all any data that we have comparing violent approaches with nonviolent approaches suggests that um get ready for this violent approaches are more dangerous <laughs> and um uh, uh yet people are afraid of nonviolence because they are afraid that somehow that makes them more vulnerable and um in in my way of thinking about nonviolence that's uh very much not true uh nonviolence gives you a new repertoire to add to the repertoire of skills and behavior and things that you know that you already have uh it it certainly doesn't take away your capacity for violence if if you're afraid that someone's going to prevent you from being violent well nobody can really do that uh you can be as violent as you want um and it's your choice but i think when a person learns nonviolence they learn that choosing violence is like choosing to fail it's uh it there are always better options especially if we make good use of time and if we are proactive and set up conditions in which uh violence is probably not going to threaten us um but uh people's usual conception of nonviolence again is very superficial it's very shallow and um i think people believe that the word nonviolence somehow explains itself which it doesn't and if you just look at the word it looks like it means no violence can't do that something that you can't do uh my uh friend um Rachel McNair who has written a, a book about uh the psychology of peace uh she uh, she says you know when a person becomes a vegetarian it's not just about not eating meat anymore it's about beginning to think about all the things you can do 
with vegetables. And uh, all, and she said, almost always, it, it opens up new possibilities because you've, you've closed off one option and it forces you to look into a, a broader domain of possible things that you could eat and things that you could do. And nonviolence is kind of like that too. If you have, make a decision that you're not gonna contribute to violence because violence represents failure and you don't wanna go there, then you start thinking about other ways to solve problems. And um, uh, I, th I think if you pursue that, further into the future, what I imagine is a world or a community in which people are focused on um, doing interesting things, helping each other, having fun, uh, taking time to express themselves, uh, enjoying each other's company in, in this community that is thriving in a healthy way and uh, people are solving problems cooperatively. Um, by the way, it's not violent. But the nonviolence is a byproduct of the fact that everybody is living well and, and prospering and having fun. And um, uh, whether nonviolent, whether you think of nonviolence as sort of a byproduct like that, or as something that you have to pursue as a, the cause, one of the causes of a society like that. I don't think um, I don't think that's a choice you have to make. I think nonviolence is both cause and effect. But we are weak on the cause side because we we're not teaching people nonviolence in school. Yeah. And um, think, you know. Th Think about how different this year would be if everyone had been uh, vaccinated against the coronavirus uh, five years ago. Yeah. Uh, we would not have an epidemic, but teaching nonviolence is a little bit like vaccinating people or inoculating them against the future violence that people might be involved in. Uh, yeah. I, I think one when I and uh, other teachers of nonviolence and, and related disciplines that come under different names, um, when we're teaching, we are inoculating. We are, we are vaccinating our students, hopefully, yeah. against uh, future violence. And uh, like other kinds of prevention, it's very difficult to measure the effects of that. I wanted to ask to what extent you are able to draw from your discipline, the one that you actually teach originally, psychology. How much basis is there in human psychology for what you now know is true and possible in true nonviolence? Yeah. Because yeah, there is that... there is a huge debate on what is the essential nature of the human being? Is it to be violent or is it to be nonviolent? Yeah, and and you know, like Dr. King said, we have the potential for both, and uh, like like many of the uh, traditions around the world will teach us, um, we have that potential for both, and it depends which side of yourself you feed, uh, which will become the strongest and which will become predominant. Um, but uh, yeah. Uh, I may have lost the thread of your question. Uh, that in psychology, in human psychology, uh, we know that in our evolutionary journey, both violence and nonviolence are a part of what has made us what we are today as homo sapiens. Yeah, that, that's uh, almost necessarily true. Yeah. That's right. So in this context, is violence more natural to us than nonviolence? That is the question that many people ask. Well, violence has an advantage because it is aided by impulse. And impulse is very fast. 
uh, it's one of the types of thinking that um, my colleague Daniel Kahneman has written about in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. He says that in co human cognition, there are two systems, but uh, one is faster than the other. And um, in some ways they, uh, they perform complementary functions. Uh, but um, nonviolence needs the, uh, the, the depth and the complexity of the slow system. And um, uh, nonviolence education has to work there. Eventually it will produce quicker nonviolent responses to compete with impulsive violent responses, but that takes time. And um, in, in the book, uh, I, I use the metaphor of swimming to explain why it takes time. Why you can't just uh, decide that you'll be a swimmer and by snapping your fingers, you suddenly are an accomplished swimmer. It doesn't work that way. Uh, uh, swimming takes practice, you know, it takes instruction at the beginning and then it takes lots of practice and nonviolence is the same thing. Um, so in our courses and workshops, it's like we're giving swimming lessons and uh, we're helping people to get started. But if it's going to be really a change in a person's life, it's something they'll have to continue to practice. And hopefully we, we get across the need to do that too. Great. So in your book, you have a whole chapter called Agape, Ahimsa, and the Third Way. Uh, mm -hmm. So for those listening to this program, can you firstly explain the concept of Agape? Because most people are not familiar with that. And also what Ahimsa means to you and what is the third way? Well, I, and this is Iris part of the book, so I, I can't claim to be a, an expert here. But um, uh, to me, agape is an important word in the Christian tradition. It, um, it's a Greek word that means love. And there are several words in Greek that mean love, but they're distinguished from one another. You know, the uh, eros means a uh, romantic love uh, or uh, infatuation and uh, falling in love and so on. And philia uh, has a couple of meanings. It could mean brotherly love, like the love that brothers and sisters have for each other. Uh, and it could also mean the love that friends have for each other. Uh, agape is more of an unconditional love that you have for other people simply because they are fellow human beings. And um, in order to have agape and to cultivate it, I think you have to first believe that other people are cool, that, <laughs> that other people are, are worth identifying with and um, so in some of the book and certainly in some of the trainings that we do, we do a little work on showing that there is a, a positive common ground that almost all people share with each other. And uh, that's why agape makes sense. And once, um, once a person has that goodwill toward others, many other things become possible. Um, we, you know, we have a, a saying a little further along that, um, you know, all of your skills will work better if you actually like people. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if that, if that liking is as deep as, you know, agape, the way we're talking about it, then you will be fine in dealing with other people and you'll be able to enlist their cooperation and uh, many other good things will happen. Uh, getting into nonviolence viewed in this broad way was very helpful for me when I was a university administrator, when I was a chair of a big department. 
it gave me a perspective that was just so helpful when things were frustrating and when my colleagues would, you know, be driving me up the wall. Um, and I, uh, I really recommend a good uh, education in nonviolence for anyone who's going to be in a leadership position. Um, once again, I, I know that my students are going to be future leaders. Uh, and I know that leadership and power can corrupt people. So I'm trying to inoculate against that corruption as well. Uh, I think that's very important for all teachers to do if, if they can, but it's, it's really part of my uh, intention when I teach a new group of students. I don't want them to end up being like some of the leaders we have seen in this time uh, who seem to, they seem to represent uh, both ignorance and excesses of pride and self-congratulation for things that are not worthy of congratulation. And I don't want to be led by people like that. In, in what way is there both a complementarity and yet some difference in the tradition from which Agape comes and the tradition from which Ahimsa comes? Do you feel comfortable in dealing with that? I just want to know what your intuitive response to yeah. that is. Yeah, I, and I, um, I feel comfortable holding them side by side and not trying to, in a logical way, trying to reconcile them or saying that one is, can be reduced to the other. Because, and, and I'm influenced here by uh, an author that I used to read all the time, uh, the paleontologist, uh, Stephen Jay Gould. And uh, he pointed out that sometimes the best explanations of why things are the way they are, are historical. Uh, they're not logical. They're not uh, theoretical. Uh, they're not something you can figure out in the absence of historical knowledge. Things came to be the way they are out of cultural traditions. And uh, in his case, out of um, you know, species that had a particular form and uh, that had a particular niche in the world. And um, I think that's a tremendously important insight but it helps me to uh, think about agape and ahimsa as each having their own integrity and each bringing with them a, a sort of a cultural tradition that does not need to be mashed. <laughs> uh, some people would say, maybe these are the same concept. Historically, they came from different cultures. They you know, they're, they're not the same in that sense. Um, and uh, perhaps a lexicographer making up a dictionary might produce very similar definitions, but that's lexicography. That's a human, you know, artificial thing. Uh, yeah. the, these, to me, they're, they're ideas that are sources of energy and sources of inspiration. Yeah. And um, I think leaving them in their own cultural context and just learning about them with the cultural stuff attached is the best way to go. Excellent. Yeah, that's that's my feeling too. Maybe one way to explore this is through the life of Martin Luther King Jr. Because we know that, and you have said this in detail in your own book, that he's repeatedly urging us not to resist evil in a way that the evil itself dictates on the terms that are set by the evil. Right. Uh, so maybe if you could uh, elaborate on that in particular, because you have written about this, how this directed his response to the Ku Klux Klan. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a story about um, one of 
Dr. King's friends, who was um, James Lawson. And uh, James uh, Lawson had traveled to India to study the work of Gandhi. And that would have been in the late 1940s and early 1950s. It was after uh, the Mahatma had uh, passed. But um, Lawson became a teacher of nonviolence to many of the young people who became the, the soldiers of the civil rights movement. And um, there was a demonstration one Saturday night in Nashville, Tennessee. And my friend Bernard Lafayette was part of this demonstration. And the students were actually marching home from, they were walking home after having spent most of the day sitting in at lunch counters and um, holding signs, you know, uh, opposing segregation. <clears throat> and the, the line of marchers started to be harassed by a gang of young white guys. And uh, they were wearing motorcycle jackets and uh, they appeared to be a gang, but uh, they started beating up um, one of the student demonstrators named uh, a young man named Solomon Gort. And uh, Bernard saw this attack and he used one of the skills that he had learned in his workshops, which was he threw his own body over Solomon Gort to prevent him from receiving any more blows. And so Bernard started to receive the blows. Well, uh, Reverend Lawson saw this happening and uh, he, uh, he walked up to the leader of the gang and um, he said, uh, I see you're, you're wearing a jacket, seems to be a motorcycle jacket. Do you have a motorcycle? And um, the white guy spat at him, he spat in his face. And um, uh, Reverend Lawson said, do you have a handkerchief? And the guy was startled again, but he gave Jim a handkerchief. And then um, uh, Jim said, you know, I have a motorcycle too. And they got into this conversation about motorcycles, partly because Jim had just broken the script. The, uh, he had changed the direction of what was going on. And the other members of the motorcycle gang gathered around and they got into this conversation. And Jim just talked to them very respectfully as another you know, person who rode my motorcycles. But in the process of doing that, the beating stopped. And the students were able to get up and go on their way. And eventually Jim was on good enough terms with the leader of this gang that he also said, well, I have to go now but man, I really like talking with you about motorcycles. And um, I think uh, that was exactly the skill set that Martin Luther King wanted Jim Lawson to bring to the South to educate people in the practice of nonviolence in, in a way that would really stick. And with Bernard, Lafayette, it really stuck because he made a career of nonviolence education. And um, he certainly changed the direction of my career about halfway through. So um, what, sorry, go ahead. No, good. But uh, no. no, the last thing I was gonna say is that there are little uh, examples of impact like that all over. Yes. The, yes. and. They don't draw attention to themselves in the same yeah. way that violence does. Yeah. So we don't hear about them in the newspaper. That's right. But I think in the long run, they are more important than the acts of violence that occur in the newspaper. And don't they also show that actually it is hate that is more fragile? Uh, yes. And people, 
people are so afraid. Um, it prevents them from, you know, poking hate and watching it fall down. Yeah. But yeah, uh, it, we, we just need to be smarter in the way we raise kids to know about these skills. And it, again, it's a little bit like vaccinating people because if you vaccinate enough people, if you get enough kids who know what they're doing around nonviolence, then suddenly they are supporting each other and no one kid has to do it all by themselves. And when an incidence of violence occurs, a crowd of kids who are knowledgeable about nonviolence will surround the incident and make it stop. And um, uh, that's where we need to go. Um, so in this context, it must be particularly painful for you to see the continuing episodes of shootings in America where completely innocent people are being gunned down in schools and in another public places. Yeah. How do you deal with that? I'm uh, how, As a person, how do you deal with that? It's, uh, it's very frustrating, um, especially when we have the knowledge to, to, to know where this comes from and uh, First of all, the knowledge is not very widespread. And second of all, the will to change it seems to be very weak in this generation. But um, in, in cognitive psychology, and again, I'll sort of refer to Daniel Kahneman. Uh, in his work with Amos Tversky, one of the principles of thought that he explored is called availability, which is that our thoughts are driven by the information that is most available. And our actions also are driven by what our environment affords to us. Now in the, in the United States, guns are widely available. There are more guns than people in the United States. And um, it, Guns are ready to hand in many instances in which disputes occur and people get angry. Um, guns are at hand when a depressed person considers suicide. Um, guns are at hand when a disgruntled employee or a disgruntled student wants to go back to the place where they had such a difficult time and kill people with. In the, in the United States, so many of these forms of violence are, they're facilitated by the ready availability of guns. And on top of that, there is an, a widespread ideology that this is a right that American citizens have. And many people who emphasize that right seem to behave as if it's also a responsibility and that's just insane. That is not sane behavior. It's not sane thought. And it fails to recognize a lot of simple things about just human factors engineering. You know, it, many people's ownership of guns is driven by a fantasy about how they're going to use them successfully if they are ever attacked by an enemy. And, you know, I often point out to uh, people who bring that up, that in order for you to use a gun successfully, and to play out the fantasy in your mind, about 20 things have to go in your favor within a few seconds, without any mistakes, and without you hurting yourself in the process. That's very unlikely to happen. It's like flipping a coin and getting, you know, um, 20 heads in a row. Um, and uh, the, 
uh, the frequency of self-inflicted gunshot accident, accidental wounds is very high in the United States, but we don't know exactly how high because there is a federal law against doing research on gun violence. And uh, that has really hampered our ability to learn in detail about all of these different kinds of violence that occur. Again, it's insane. It, and um, that's my perspective on it. And I do find it very frustrating. Yeah, um, naturally. Uh, shifting to a somewhat different domain, uh, in what ways is nonviolence featuring in the current Black Lives Matter movement? I know that it's a very different universe from what Martin Luther King was working on. And yet there is a link. It's, it's historically part of the same impulse for justice, for dignity, uh, yeah. for equal rights. Uh, so do you find any strands of the nonviolence impulse in this current moment? Oh, yes. Yes, I do. Uh, and first of all, the Black Lives Matter movement is very diverse and uh, very widespread in the United States. I think, um, you know, demonstrations have occurred in over 400 communities. Uh, and the, the information that I have is that it's overwhelmingly peaceful. Um, the, uh, and in any demonstration, some of the violence that may occur is often opportunistic violence uh, by people who have nothing to do with the movement. So that's a little difficult to tease out as well. It, that's for, you know, master's thesis and doctoral dissertation work <laughs> in the future. But, um, I think there is a very good uh, awareness that nonviolence is the way to go uh, among the vast majority of people who are involved in the movement because they have absorbed the idea that um, this is how you maintain the high road. Um, this is uh, the way you protect yourself from criticism and you're gonna be criticized anyway. In, in the United States, the, the, the reactionary side of our political spectrum will criticize anything that the progressive side is doing. But um, uh, one, of, one of the ideas that Martin Luther King was very aware of, I think has been passed down and it, it has penetrated uh, quite well, which is that, um, you don't want to give your opponent the weapons with which to beat you up. And um, if you slip off the high road, if you become guilty of violence yourself, that's what you're doing. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I think the, I, I teach uh, uh, students at Baltimore City Community College. So I know hundreds of students who are African-American, the, the college is located just down the road from the, the place where um, uh, the Freddie King um, death at the hands of the police took place. That's one of our local tragedies. But I'm in the middle of that when I am teaching in Baltimore. And um, I, I feel that to the extent that I know these young people, they are really good young people and they get it. They, they get a lot of uh, what we're talking about. Now, they, they, don't, they don't have the benefit of uh, hearing workshops from me all the time, but you know, not very many people do. But <laughs> the point is they, they, don't, they don't need it that much. There is a lot of really good understanding and knowledge going on. Um, you know, Bernard, Lafayette sometimes cautions us not to sell sh young people short um, because he said that's that's ageism. That you know we often talk about ageism where it's the elderly who are the victims, but old people are guilty of you know minimizing the importance of the young and the talents of the young too, and. Um, 
and then Bernard goes on further. He says, you know, it's all childism. It, it's all racism, sexism. It's all inappropriately treating other people as if they were children and, and applying your, your nasty ageism uh, to another group. And that's, it, you know, I, I am frustrated, uh, Rajni, but uh, you can't help but see some of this as funny. It is, it is. But drawing on these experiences with young people, what advice would you give? Uh, because this is kind of the closing question I ask everyone. Because here in India, I meet a lot of young people who are instinctively drawn to nonviolence, and yet they do feel daunted. They don't know if in practical terms it can be done. And it is very natural for them to, fa uh, you know, to feel a reaction when they, are con yeah. when, they are, when they are, in a sense, assaulted by the politics of hatred. Yeah. It's very natural for them to feel repulsed by it. They want yeah. to respond in a nonviolent way, but yeah. they don't know how. So right. what are some of, one, A, the inner strengths that they can cultivate, and two, outward methodologies? What would you recommend to them? Yeah. Well, again, I, uh, I, I, I think a good thing to say to almost all young people is, you know, you're a good person and you're already doing a lot of things right. Um, but if you want to identify with nonviolence, then really study it. You know, you should be reading something by the, the Mahatma or by Dr. King or by other um, people who have done a lot of thinking in this field, probably every day. And, um, uh, that's, it's like learning to play a musical instrument. You know, you practice every day. Um, and in responding to something, if you've been assaulted, um, don't respond right away. You know, don't use that Kahneman system one impulsive thinking. It's probably not a complete solution. These, these impulsive responses that seems so necessary somehow, they're usually incomplete and they are most often wrong in, in, as an approach to the problem. So think about it, you know, th think about you have this problem. Perhaps there, there's this person in your life that is a, a problem. You have to see them every day, but they insult you and and they are mean to you and they make your life miserable. What can you do about that? Um, my, uh, my wife and I had a, a young friend, the, the son of a couple, another couple that we know. And um, he was being bullied when he was in high school. Um, he was an artistic kid. He, he was big, but he didn't want to use his size and his strength to hurt other people. But he was teased and insulted and bullied all the time. And um, so his parents asked him to come and talk to us. About, and we talked with him. And first of all, we had a great conversation with him because he's a wonderful young man. Um, but when we got around to the bullying, um, uh, I can't remember if it was Pam or me that asked uh, him. Um, uh, Andrew, this bully, I mean, what does he like to do? What is, what, what's, what's he up to? And uh, our friend, uh, young friend Andrew said, um, I don't know, he's always got headphones in his ears. He's always listening to music. And I said, well, look, you, you know, you've been to music camp with us, you know, we, you, you know some music too, and you like music. Why don't you um, uh, ask him some questions about the music that he likes? Uh, and we didn't, that was just a, almost a throwaway suggestion, but it comes from this place where, you know, you try to create, figure out what is the common ground that you have with the other person. 
But anyway, Andrew went and did that. And he eventually became friends with this kid. Um, and uh, it's not guaranteed to work out that way every time. But if you don't try strategies like that, of course, it'll never work. It, it's like this principle that you know, if you don't try, you take yourself out of the game. And um, so the, the real question is, what kind of trying should we do? And um, I think that we should be trying in the domain of good things. Uh, and if we do that, other people may pick up some of the good things that are relatable to them that they find personally meaningful. And then you can develop a bond. Um, and I think that's a good approach to teaching in general because many teachers uh, burn out because they are trying to control what happens in the classroom and they're trying to control what their students learn. And uh, that's a fool's errand uh, in, if you push it too far because you can't control what another person's mind will find interesting or will notice or will take up and make their own. Um, I just, uh, I gave a talk about just a few days ago uh, to the American Psychiatric Association convention. And I talked about using nonviolence to combat racism. And uh, one of the problems we have, especially in our political climate in the United States, is that if you talk to somebody with the aim of reducing their racism, they become very defensive. Like, I'm not a racist, you know, and um, they'll stop listening to you if they feel that that's your intention. But one of the things I've noticed in teaching nonviolence is that it changes some of the racial attitudes of my students without any direct instruction on my part. Um, but it was something that the student found in my course and they drew a conclusion about their own racism from it. And because it was them that drew the conclusion, they owned it. They took possession of the insight and uh, they didn't have to be defending against me because I wasn't pushing anything about racism on them. So the, that illustrates, I think, the task for teachers, which is tricky. Some instruction does need to be direct. You know, you, you need to teach some things that you want the student to pick up and for the student to learn what was taught. But a lot of what students learn is just happening all the time. It's, it, it's like a fire, a fire hose of life experience is causing them to learn things all the time that has nothing to do with teachers or anything. And what a teacher can do is just to learn to put a few things in the student's path that they might pick up. And it's the teacher's responsibility that those be good things. So that if the, teach, if the student does pick them up, it will be of value and it will help the student to become a more nonviolent person or a more aware and sensitive person, a stronger person. Yeah. yeah. So in closing, uh, you've been doing this for several decades and I, what is the secret to your having so much confidence about it? I mean, you have explained a lot, but uh, if I may still ask you to address the cynicism or the skepticism of a lot of people out there who think, oh, nonviolence is such a lovely idea, but it's not possible in this hard, ugly world. Uh, yeah. So in closing, what would you say to them? Well, I think we've got to surround people with information that's not so hard and ugly. Um, first of all, students are hungry for stories about problems being solved nonviolently. And there are many 
I mean, the, if we just forget, you know, not pay so much attention to the word nonviolence, people are solving problems successfully all day long, little problems. And occasionally big problems, you know, like problems in the family or problems with friends. Those are all examples of nonviolence, even if the label doesn't get applied. But we should be studying the successes that we want to have and including them in what we understand nonviolence to be. Um, so I'm confident about nonviolence, partly because I have sort of filled myself up with lots of stories about successful problem solving and, um, uh, and also about stories of individual sort of insights, you know, people in prison who have had an insight about what they might do with their life that's different and they've turned themselves around. Um, there are lots of stories like that. If we feed ourselves with examples that build our skills in nonviolence, then we'll gain a lot of confidence from that. Now, do I think um, just by calling what I do nonviolence means that I'm gonna be successful? No, um, you can try a nonviolent solution and it may fail on you. You know, violence is almost sure to fail, but nonviolence can fail too. And we can't totally avoid violence either. I mean, the, the, way, the way Ira and I put it in our book is that we want to raise the threshold for the use of violence so high that maybe violence never occurs. Um, because we don't think violence is necessary except in very, very rare instances. And I think Mahatma Gandhi and uh, Dr. King uh, would acknowledge that too. In, in their writings, they say, yes, there are some circumstances where you, you, you know, if the choice is between being passive and being violent, well, at least violence is active. And, you know, you, sh you really should do something. You know. um, but those examples, you know, everybody wants to reserve the right to be violent to themselves. It's, and uh, again, it's one of those things that's sort of silly because nobody can take away the ability to be violent from a person. You know, that's, nobody can do that. I can't do that. The Mahatma can't do that. But um, uh, we have this sort of logical conundrum. I think everybody in the world wants everybody else to be nonviolent. Um, but if there's still a lot of violence, what does that mean? It means that there are some people who are really holding onto it. And um, uh, we've, we've got to a, a sort of attack that through our educational systems as being a silly and unproductive and destructive um, thing that's only gonna make the person unhappy. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the most unhappy sufferers of PTSD, post-traumatic distress syndrome, according to my friend, uh, Rachel McNair, um, the worst cases of PTSD are among soldiers who have killed. Um, the, a veteran who comes back from a war with the knowledge that they have killed other people, um, they will suffer terribly because of that. And um, the, uh, the, the James Gilligan, who's a psychiatrist that I deeply respect, um, he says uh, something <clears throat> very similar. Um, people who have been immersed in violence are, are lacking in, in respect and they feel that they have not been respected themselves. And um, the knowledge that they have committed violent crime, crimes eats away at them psychologically. 
So violence does terrible damage first and foremost to the person who is violent. And I think that's one of the strongest reasons to teach people how not to engage in it. Thank you so much. It's Thank been you. a pleasure. <laughs>